it is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So speaking of which, have any of you ever heard of the band U2? Some? Okay. Um, well, I, I really love witty people, and I've never considered myself that witty, and so when I have a witty moment, I, I capitalize on it and brag on it for years and years. So um, back when I was in college, I worked for this you know, cool, hip church planter slash small church pastor. And we were in a coffee shop one day having staff meeting, just the two of us. And I don't remember what we were talking about, but he, for some reason, just blurted out, you know what, I think we should elect Bono president. And without missing a beat, I said, well, then the streets would have no name. <laughs> U2 has another hit song called Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. And the song is about all the things the songwriter has done, most of his worldly pursuits, his relationships, but then he gets to a place where he sings, you broke the bonds, you loose the chains, you carried the cross of my shame, oh my shame, I believe it, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And what strikes me is that there's clearly some Jesus reality in this song, He's singing about the kingdom come. He's singing about the promises of God to his people uh, that he believes in. And he even sings about the crucified Lord in the part where he says, you carried the cross for my shame. But the thing that I find interesting is that even if you journey all the way to Good Friday, if you stop there and you see the Savior on the cross and behold the crucified Lord, you still haven't found what you're looking for. It's not enough. That's why this day matters. Because on this day, the day that we encounter the risen Christ is the day that we finally realize that all we're looking for is in him. That it's not a what are you looking for, but it's a who. Who are you looking for? It's Easter you're in this sanctuary off of Highway 59 in Robertsdale in 2018 for this hour. And I believe with all of my being that you are here, regardless of what you think, you are here because God drew you here. You are here because God has collected us together as a people to worship him and to hear the greatest news on the face of the planet in the history of our world. We are together to meet the risen Christ and all of us, whether we admit it or not, are looking for something. We're looking for answers to our questions. We're looking for our needs to be met. We're looking for ultimate fulfillment or purpose or someone to help us make sense of our lives and the crazy world that we live in. And today, I declare to you today that the question is not what are we looking for, but it's who. Who are you looking for? This is the question that Jesus actually asked a woman named Mary on the first Easter morning. The story is found in John chapter 20. You're welcome to turn there if you'd like, or the words are going to be up on the screen. I'm going to start in verse 11 and read through verse 18. John 20, verses 11 through 18. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had, laid, had been laid, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. April Fool's! The first and greatest April Fool's joke ever. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to go back and look at one piece of this story that is unusual in that it only appears in the Gospel of John. Mary mistakes Jesus for the gardener. Why would she do that? And why does it matter? One of the things that we learn in reading the Gospels is that they're all a little bit different, even though several of them are very much alike, and they're different for a reason. Everything in them matters and is there for a purpose. So why does John put this in his Gospel, that, that Mary mistakes Jesus for the garden? It happens that John is also the only Gospel in which we find that Jesus was laid in a tomb in a garden. That the place where Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb from a wealthy man who you might have heard of named Nicodemus, a tomb that had never been used, that that tomb was located in a garden. Why does that matter? Well, because John begins his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the word. And the word was God and the word was with God. And the word was the light of men, and the light came into the darkness. And that story reminds us of the very first words in the entire Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and there was nothing but darkness. And the Spirit of God hovered over that darkness and said, let there be light. He spoke it. And by his word, light entered the darkness. So John's gospel wants to go back and connect us to the beginning of the story. And in the beginning of the story, we also find that God is a creator God. And he starts making things, right? He makes habitats. He makes this world. And he makes the sky and the sun and the moon and the stars. And then he makes creatures to populate all of the habitats. Creatures to fly in the sky, creatures to swim in the sea, and creatures to crawl along the ground. And then the crowning jewel of his creation, the thing that he makes last and most important, humans. And do you remember where he put his first humans? In a garden. In a garden. And things went wrong in that garden, didn't they? The humans were banished from that garden because the, the few simple rules that God gave them, they chose to break. Do not eat from the two trees in the middle of the garden, and we ate. Well, the end of the story in the book of Revelation, it just so happens, also has to do with the garden. And guess who the author of the book of Revelation is? John! <laughs> So in Revelation, the vision that God gave John, he sees the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem where heaven and earth finally become one and evil and death and sorrow all go away. And guess where we end up? In a garden. And the tree of life is there in the middle of the garden and it's no longer forbidden. You know why? Because God is no longer concerned with us living forever in a cursed state. We can eat from the tree of life, and the leaves, it tells us, will be for the healing of the nations, and a river will flow in the middle of the garden. So our story begins in a garden, and we get kicked out, and God's project is to get us back into the garden when everything will be put right. And in the middle of those two gardens, John tells us there's another garden, and it's the garden where Jesus was buried and Mary mistakes him for the gardener. But does she? What does the first garden tell us about who God is? That he's a creator God, right? If anybody has a green thumb, <laughs> he can make anything out of nothing, which is a physical impossibility. Because we know that matter can neither be created nor destroyed, right? Well, only God can break that rule, because he invented the rule. <laughs> God's a creator God, and creation's messed up, and creation is decaying, and creation is dying, and you and I both know that creation is broken. We talked in the sunrise service this morning at Garrett Park that John is also the only gospel that points out while it was still dark, Mary went to the tomb 
and found it empty. While it was still dark. Why is that important? Because our world is still dark, isn't it? We need to know that this message of hope comes to us while it is still dark. While we still hurt. While we still don't understand. While, while we are confused. This message of hope of Easter comes to us while it is still dark. And so this picture of Jesus as the gardener shows us that it is in this place that Jesus is the recreator. Jesus is the one who makes all things new. Jesus is the one who is restoring what was lost. Jesus, in being raised from the tomb, is reversing the decaying and dying process that is wrong with our world and wrong with us. So did Mary mistake Jesus as the gardener? I don't think she did. I think that's exactly who Jesus is, the risen Christ. And when did she realize who Jesus was? When he said her name, right? Mary. John 10 tells us that Jesus is the good shepherd. And Jesus says, my sheep will know my voice and they will follow me. My sheep will know my voice. Through Lent, we've been journeying through a series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And one thing that we've said every week, and that I believe this says to us again today, is that God did not send Jesus to give us a religion. God sent Jesus to give us a relationship. When Mary didn't recognize Jesus, he didn't start reciting to her the law, did he? He didn't remind her of the commandments she was supposed to follow. Instead, he looked her in the face and said, Mary. Such an intimate picture of a relationship to know and be known. That's what God invites us into in the person of Jesus. He wants all of us to have that same relationship. That same voice that called Mary's name is calling each one of us right now. It's here today if we will only listen. It's drawing us and calling us into a relationship with the risen Savior. And the question for us today is, who is it that we're looking for? Who are we looking for? I can't help but think that I, I would love to meet that risen Savior the way that Mary did, the way that the disciples got to meet him when he appeared on the shore after the resurrection and made them a fish breakfast. I would rather not have fish for breakfast, but to see Jesus, I think I would stomach it because I would love to see what that must have been like. He had... He had recognizable features, and yet he also had this otherworldly quality about him. Mary did not immediately recognize him, and the disciples, even though they realized it was Jesus when he called to them, when they got to shore, it says that they kept wanting to ask him, is it really you? Is it really you? And I can only imagine how different he must have looked to make them want to ask that. Do you realize we have never seen a body that doesn't age. We've never seen a body that is not uh, pale at times or sickly or weak or feeble or subject to the decaying and dying motion of this world. Jesus was the first one to walk around in that kind of a body. And I can't imagine what it must have looked like for the disciples to say, we know it's you, but we can't tell if it's really you because you don't look the same as you did during our fishing trip a year and a half ago. I would love to behold that Jesus, but we can't. So how is it that he appears to us today? How can we hear his voice the same way Mary heard him say her name? I think the answer is in the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Father will send another who will come and, and be with you. He will send another in my name who will be with you and be the presence of God and empower you. He will be the Spirit of God in you. And that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that's with us here today. And it's that same Spirit that's drawing us into a relationship with God and offering it to us if only we would recognize Him. He is the one we will celebrate in about 50 days on another Sunday called Pentecost. The question is, when Christ appears to us, when Christ speaks to us, in whatever form he wants, will we recognize him? Will he be the one we're looking for? Will we let him change our image of him if necessary? And will we believe by faith 
that he's the one calling us? Are we a cynic looking for a dead Jesus? Are we a skeptic looking for a grave robbery? Are we an egotist looking only for a Jesus made in our image? Are we a nationalist looking for a Jesus who shares our patriotic ideals? Are we a realist waiting to believe until we can put our fingers in the holes and the piercing? If we are any of those things, I'm here to tell you today we're in good company because I just described the first followers of Jesus, the first disciples who heard the story from Mary that Jesus is alive, that he's not dead, that he's risen, that the tomb is empty, grieving and not understanding, and still, even after he appears to them, risen and resurrected, struggling to figure this reality out, the one thing that he offers to them and that he offers to us today, before we have all the answers, is that they could experience him. They could experience him. And so can we. We can experience the risen Savior today. He would call them and us to have enough hope and faith to believe in the risen Christ as he appears speaking our name, operating in the world on his terms. So there's four choices I think that are before us today, and I just want to offer these to you and let you decide where you are and what your next step is. And the first one is receive Christ as he is. Just receive Christ as he is. It's a step that we all must take. In Acts chapter 2 verse 41, the apostle Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. He preached this amazing sermon about who Jesus was and what happened on the first Easter. And in response, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. I wish to God before I die I could preach a sermon like that. 3,000 thousand responding to Jesus after the sermon. Where can I get baptized? We have all afternoon. We're going to have to go to the Gulf. There's not enough water. I would love that. And I'm here to tell you that here at Robertsdale United Methodist Church, we offer baptism whenever anyone's ready. All you have to do is have a conversation about what God's doing in your life and what this step is that you're taking. Baptism is the sign that we have received Christ as he is, that we have put our faith in him, allowing the grace of God to wash over us, cleanse us, and make us new, the gardener recreating us. We have some confirmands that are coming uh, next week, and I am so excited about Confirmation Sunday because these young men and women around age 11 and 12 are confirming their faith for themselves. They are making this personal decision to receive Christ. Some of them are gonna be baptized for the first time. They've never been baptized and they're going to receive that symbol of what it means to belong to the covenant family of God. Some of them have been baptized and they're confirming what God did at their baptism. God already claimed them and so did the church and now they're claiming him. They're saying, Lord, I want to be yours. All of us have to make this this decision of faith, take this step of receiving Christ as he is. The, The second choice is don't go it alone. And this might be one of the most important because as soon as we receive Christ, we live in a society that that really doesn't do community the way we used to or the way that other cultures do. And we will not read in the pages of a New Testament of an isolated Christian. There's no such thing. It's impossible to do this thing on our own. So we intentionally have several Sunday school classes and Bible studies. We have opportunities every week for fellowship, to grow spiritually together, to spend time with other believers because we know the importance of doing community together with others who have experienced the risen Christ so that then we can go out into the world and be the light that God's calling us to be. Maybe that's your step to group up with some other believers, to get involved in some kind of a small group or Bible study to grow in your faith. Number three is learn more of who he is. Sorry, there's a Bible verse that goes with that, I forgot. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So that was also their response to hearing the word. Choice number three is learn more of who he is. And this is a step that we all have to take as we just, as we grow and as we develop and invest in our relationship with God. It's a relationship. 
And so to do that, we have to get to know him. We have to get to know the voice of the good shepherd. It's why we come to church on a weekly basis. It's why we read our Bibles and pray regularly. It's why we serve others. Did you know that a great way to see the face of Christ and to learn what his voice sounds like is to submit yourself in service of others? To step outside of your own life and your own selfish needs for a little while and do some serving? That's a great way to see Christ out in the world. All of these are ways that we nurture our relationship with him and get to know him better. We take Holy Communion. So maybe one of these habits is your next step if you don't practice these habits already. And fourth, our final step is go and tell others the news, I have seen the Lord. Just as Mary was that first witness of the resurrection of Jesus, we are called to be witnesses too. How will people know the good news unless they hear about it? How will others meet the one that they're really looking for if those of us who know him don't introduce them? If we say, I have met the risen Savior, and I know that you're looking for something, I know that you're really looking for someone, and I know the one you're looking for, can I introduce you to him? Let my life be a witness to the faith of the risen Christ and his work in my life. So whatever your next step is, I just challenge you on this Easter, let today be the day, let this week be the week that you take that step and let us be the ones who help you take it. Because the risen Christ is calling our names. He wants a relationship. He wants you to take your next step. So Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us worship him. Would you stand with us as we sing our closing hymn? And as we do so, the prayer rails will be open. If you pray, lay anything down at the altar. If you'd like me to pray with you, I'll be down here. I'll be glad to do that. Let us worship our risen Savior. Receive this benediction, and then I invite you to remain standing as the choir leads us out with the Hallelujah Chorus.
God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and for me, that we might be forgiven and freed from the guilt of sin. Three days later, he raised Jesus from the tomb, giving us victory over sin and death, that we might be free not just from the guilt of sin, but also the power, and that we might have eternal life. Go, knowing that risen Savior, to introduce him to all you meet. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.